things in the precious name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. So in his name I would say, peace be upon you all. Peace be upon us all together. Since our Muslim friends insist on having Muhammad mentioned by name in this very singular verse, in the Tanakh, in the Song of Songs 516, I will continue on that line of explanation from the linguistic viewpoint. Hebrew is not a foreign language in the Middle East. What I mean is something may not be uh, familiar to everybody. Not every Muslim would know that. My niece, my beloved niece, Khulud, when she studied Sharia, the Islamic Sharia law in Damascus, Hebrew was on her curriculum. So this is a Muslim studying Sharia. Hebrew is part of the curriculum. Maybe uh, from the point of knowing your enemy. But Hebrew is not foreign language. To me, people ask, how do you know some of the Hebrew? Well, it's a long story. It started 1974 at that beginning, uh, end of January. 74 when I joined the ABTS in Lebanon, that uh, theological seminary. And the uh, class before me had a semester before, so students were reading and writing Hebrew on the board, uh, reciting while I was at a loss. So I said to the principal, we were only one class. So I had no other choice. There is no other options. I said, I cannot continue. There is no way. And uh, Dr. Henry Grant, who is with the Lord now, who was teaching us the Hebrew, he said, brother, on your knees. Uh, some may understand what I'm saying. He was one of those old-fashioned Presbyterian background. That could be enough for some. Nevertheless, I took the challenge and I went on my knees. It means I went on prayer to study the Hebrew. So I would say in a simple way I excelled. And I had the best mark at the end of the year. Top mark for the whole class. When I've done the work for the Masters of Divinity, Dr. Morland went with us through very good book to study Hebrew. It's co complicated in a way, very difficult language, but delighted to have gone through the first four chapters of the book of Job and the final five chapters, that is from 38 to 42. What a delight studying that book. Uh, or good part of it in Hebrew, in more depth and details linguistically. So I'm a student. That's what I want to say. I am just a student. Talking about Job, you know, Job is the man who mentioned uh, the extinct animals, for instance, he mentioned Behemoth and Luyatan. Job mentioned the constellations, the Orion, the Pleiades, the bear, and he had a knowledge that was not transpired as such in later scripture. Typical to his age. Possibly he was the first one in the scripture, age-wise. Uh, date-wise, by mentioning those extinct animals who were apparently not far from his age, from his time, I mean, age not as how many years, but from his time uh, of that period. He, he mentioned the earth, that God hung the earth on nothing, when at that time everybody would believe that the earth stood on some 
something was supported by the own, by the atlas, by uh, uh, so many things, mountains, uh, fixing it, uh, making it stable, but Job mentioned that God hanged the earth on nothing. Anyhow, this is the Hebrew. And that's me as a student. So last uh, episode, we talked about Mahmat. We tackled that. And uh, we found the most used derivative of the word is Mahmat itself. Five times more than anything else. And that is the word closer to Muhammad. But you agreed with me. I'm sure my viewers agree that those verses mentioned Muhammad do not represent Muhammad, the prophet of Islam. By no means, Muhammad is presented there. And here we come today to the continuation of few other verses in the scripture. And I will go with you slowly to the Hebrew as well. Here we have the word Mahamadai. Mahamadai. Here we have Peta under the Dolit. The second word Mahamadino. Oh, sorry, this shouldn't be closed here. The meme, the meme is closed only at the end of the word. Uh, we have noon and wow, so ma ha ma di dino. So the yod will make the, the sound. Mahamadino, and then Mahamadiha. This is better mean, no? Mahamadiha, with comments at the end. Mahamadihim. And now this meme is closed totally. So, Mahamadim, I believe this is Segol, uh, under the A, Yod. And then we have Mahamadim, Mahamadim, how do we forget that? That is the song of, song, Chapter 5, verse 16. Coming to the bottom of the paper, I find it. Mahamadim. Mahamadim. That's what uh, caught the attention of our Islamist so-called scholar in the Christian Bible, like uh, Ahmed Hidat. Now we come to the references to the biblical occurrences where this word Muhammad and its derivative occurred in the few verses of the scripture. As we have done in the last episode, we will be going through this now. We start in the book of Joel, Muhammadai. For you took my silver and my gold, and brought my precious valuables, Mahmadai, to your own places. And then we have Mahmadinu. All our prized possessions have been destroyed, 
You notice there is nothing pleasant about these verses. So, prized possessions, Ma'amadinu, have been destroyed. If we move to the book of Second Chronicles, chapter 36 and verse 19, they burned all its fortified buildings and destroyed all its valuable items. Valuable items, Ma'amadiha. Sorry, it's valuable items, Mahamadiha. In the book of Lamentations, chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, an enemy grabbed all her valuables. They exchanged their valuables, Mahamadihim, for just enough food to stay alive. Can you imagine the miserable situation? where they exchange all their valuables. This is part of the judgment on God's people. For food, say, say you have one kilogram of gold, like my sister uh, had one kilogram of gold stolen from their house in Damascus. You have one kilogram of gold. You are ready to put that one kilogram of gold for a bowl of soup. We end with the Song of Songs 516. His mouth is very sweet. He is totally desirable. This is my beloved, and this is my companion, O daughters of Jerusalem. You may remember when going through this verse, I displayed the Brenton translation from the Septuagint from the mid-third century BC before Christ translation of the Bible into the Greek language. Later on, after Christ, we have the Vulgata, the Latin translation by Saint Jerome. Uh, these are precious items. So there I have mentioned that in his translation he, he put not his mouth is sweet but his throat. The reason for that in the Greek language that was taken from the Hebrew in the mid 3rd century BC or BCE. The word there indicates the place where the sound comes from. The source of the sound, the back of the mouth. So that's where he said his throat. The Hebrew reads, as Dr. Naik uh, recited that, if you remember, the clip of his word. Hokko matmakim, we call Mahamadim, binot Yerushalayim. Hokko matmakim. He did not say Theo, his mouth, but Hokko, that is different from the mouth. I, I don't blame the translations. I mean, uh, Translation is to communicate with the people in the way they can understand the truth of the original text in the best possible way. So it is a, it is a very complex uh, procedure to translate a sacred text into other languages. Uh, it's a delight as well as you search the language. So. This is one of the things I, I meant to bring attention to. Nevertheless, the text is in the Hebrew language. And it is for those who are better in Hebrew to tell us more about it. What does it mean deeply, more deeply? Hokko matamakin. His mouth is throat is sweet. 
وكل مهمتين and all together desirable lovely it is not Muhammad my dear friends please understand this Salome is talking about Solomon could be another shepherd Solomon is a writer at the end of the day of this uh, precious book that is called the Song of Songs. Ze to di vize roai benot Yerushalayim. This is my beloved and this is my companion, daughters of Jerusalem. Wow, I heard the word ze tens of thousands of times when I'm with a in Lebanon and Syria with our Syrian friends and the Syriac, uh, they, 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 they mentioned a lot. So it's not clever of me to remember. They do I love it. And we, we, we sang uh, in the first episode when I talked about night trickery, uh, we sang, I am my beloved and he is mine. Anili do di, we do the girl was saying, I am my beloved and he is mine. This is the Hebrew language for us. Then we come into another important principle, which is the context. I have two things there to go through. One is concerning the meaning of context and the other one is what or how do we apply this on Muhammad or not. For instance, if I take a thread and start weaving and making something else Imagine you have another thread going through these loops and continue. That will what will make context. So instead of a lump of threads, we have something useful. The image you will see about the, the loom, the old-fashioned loom, I mean, uh, it is very basic, can be even less basic than this image we, we have. Uh, the loom produced something like this. This rug came from Algeria, made by the Amazigh, who learned the skills from the Jews who went to North Africa. Certainly peacefully. They went with skills, with knowledge, and they were welcomed. They integrated very well. The other items I will indicate, I put it specially, since I bought it, I have not put it on. It is this pure silk fan. It is made on the same loom, like the one, the primitive one in the picture. So it's not only to do the coarse uh, threads, but the finest threads as well can be done on those looms. And the man who sold me this, I bought it out of nostalgic feeling, maybe. I don't often put... Uh, good money for uh, something like that. He said they sold the same material, exactly the same one for Her Majesty. That what makes textus. It came from the Latin word con textere. 
and here we use the word context. Con, with, and texer, weave together. Weave together. In the weaving, we have the rub thread and we have the whiff thread. We have the thread that will go horizontally and we have the shuttle, the thread that will go horizontally but will in a split of seconds would go from one end to the other and sent back, one end to the other and sent back to bring the threads together. So context is important. If you don't want to get a lump of threads, you need to put things together context. And here I come to the group of questions about the context. I think the Greek is contextus. I have not checked it recently, but from uh, uh, previous knowledge I could be wrong. Con, con with, and textus uh, to put together. So here we come to a bunch of questions concerning the matter, Song of Songs 516. Let's go through them together. Is the word desirable? Mahmadim, indicating to Muhammad, can we apply the immediate context on him? As the Shalomite was saying, this is my beloved, this is my companion, O maidens of Jerusalem. Another question. Is there anything else applies to Muhammad in this chapter? Say in the chapter itself, chapter 5, when she was asked, who is your beloved that you charge us in that manner? She said, my beloved is white and ruddy. Is that Muhammad? Third question. Do we find Muhammad in the context of the whole book, the Song of Songs? If we read it, do we find Muhammad in the context of that book? So we have the very immediate context, the verse itself. We have the next context, the chapter. We have the wider context, the book altogether. First question, was Muhammad a lover and the subject of love and adoration as such? As we read in the Song of Songs, the book of love between man and woman, Solomon and Shalomite, the Jewish girl and the shepherd boy. It is not strange for a king to be called shepherd. David even called God his shepherd. In Psalm 23, Yahweh lo The Lord is my shepherd. So it is not strange that Solomon will be taking the role of the shepherd as well in the text of the Song of Songs. But do we find Muhammad there? Though he was allegedly illiterate, was Muhammad in knowledge of this verse, of this chapter, of this book? Well, finally, friends, I hope my presentation would be of help to the truth seekers. He is white and ruddy. His beauty is wondrous and visible on his body, the wounds of the cross, Savior, Redeemer, and faithful shepherd, beloved. There is no beloved like him.